Hi guys, I'm Courtney. And I'm Lisa. And welcome to the next chapter in the Book of the Dead, brought to you by Dark Cast Network, Indie Podcasts with a Twist. Hi guys, welcome to the next chapter of the Book of the Dead. Here with me today, I have a very special guest, someone that I am honored to speak to. With me is Bruce Sackman, who served as the special agent in charge, U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs Office of Inspector General, Criminal Investigations Division Northeast Field Office until May of 2005, when he retired after 32 years of service. Bruce, thank you so much for being here today. It is truly an honor to have you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be in law enforcement, and it was a double honor to be in law enforcement that's dedicated to uh, helping our nation's heroes, that being the Inspector General of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So uh, I was very honored to be in that position for so many years. And then when I left there, I went to the private sector and essentially did similar type of investigations for the private sector uh, for many, many years after that. You have had an extensive career, an honorable career, and it is a joy to have you here to talk about that career and the work that you have done. And There's, of course, a specific case that I would love to talk to you about, which we'll get to in a little bit, because I did read Behind the Murder Curtain, It, and I will have a link for that in the source notes for you guys, because I truly recommend that read. It was was quite a tale, a true tale, and it, the investigation and the work that you put into that case was astounding. Well, these cases, and many of them have occurred all over the world, not just at the VA, but all over the world. They are very, very uh, intense cases. They're intense from many different angles. One, it takes literally a village of people to solve these cases. You know, you could be the reincarnation of Sherlock Holmes. One investigator cannot do this case alone. It literally takes a team of people to do these cases. And the cases cost a lot of money to run. And a lot of police departments, especially smaller departments, don't have the resources, either the manpower or the money to spend on things like lab fees. So a number of these cases will go not only unsolved, but even they'll go without investigation because the local police departments just don't have the resources to do it. You know, I was with the federal government. So we had plenty of resources, but if you're a small police department somewhere and an incident like this happens in a small hospital, it's going to be very, very difficult for that police department to spend the time and the resources it takes to solve these cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, we covered, we've covered a couple of medical serial killers here on the Book of the Dead. And when we covered the Lane's Angels of Death, which is one of our first episodes, it went on for so long. And part of that was because it did happen in a small town in Austria, and they didn't have the resources to really look into what was happening. Well, look, you have to ask yourself this question. You know, if you're a, a police officer in a in a small town, and in, actually in any town, most cops don't become cops because we're good in chemistry and biology. So we are really very, very dependent on these medical experts um, to advise us as to what may have happened from a medical standpoint, all right? And often what happens is that the medical center will conduct their own inquiry using their own staff, and they will issue a report either verbally or in writing saying that all the patients expired as a direct result of their natural disease processes. Hey, that's why they're in the hospital, particularly in the ICU, because they have so much wrong with them, okay? So when the police show up, because brave whistleblowers, you know, come forth and say, we know something is going on here. This is what the police will face. The police will face a management from the hospital like this. 
Well, thank you very much, officer, for your concern. And we were just as concerned as you were here at the hospital. So we put together a team of our very best experts, our doctors and our nurses, and they reviewed all the cases under this nurse's or this doctor's care. And we came to the conclusion that all these patients expired as a direct result of their natural disease processes. I mean, we looked at the death certificates. We looked at the patient's records. Sometimes we even did our own in-house autopsies. And we came to this conclusion. Now, how many police departments, after they hear that, are going to want to continue that investigation as if they don't have enough to do outside of the hospital? And they don't want to go in the hospital to begin with because they find the hospital very confusing. You know, the hospital, they have this HIPAA law, this Health, uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. What exactly is that? What records can I get? What records do I need a subpoena for? Do I need a court order? Do I need a judge to sign it? Where are all these records? How many different departments? Do I really need all of this? Do I really have to go through all this? Why I have this nice report from management saying everything is fine. Well, I'll just take that report and then I'll put it in my investigative file and I'll go on to the many other cases that I have. And this is one reason why medical serial killers throughout the world, throughout the world, have successfully murdered so many people until they're finally brought to justice. You know, your traditional serial killer kill maybe what, six or seven people. But they're actually amateurs compared to my medical serial killers. The average kills somewhere 30, 60. I've had killers over 100. As a doctor in England, suspected of killing 300 patients. I mean, so why are these numbers so horrific? Well, they are so horrific in part because the police get turned away frequently from the hospital management who convinces them that there's nothing there. And why do they do that? Because they're trying to save their own butts as managers, and they're trying to save the reputation of the hospital. So how do these allegations actually come forth? Well, they come forth to me from the brave whistleblowers, the doctors and nurses who have gone to management, got poo-pooed by management, and still took it upon themselves, many times at their own personal risk, to come forth and tell us about these allegations. Hey, look, my office wasn't in a hospital. My office was in a regional office. I had no idea what was going on in a VA hospital unless somebody called me and told me. And it was the brave doctors and nurses who called me and told me that was going on that started these investigations Otherwise, I would have never known about it at all. Never known about it at all. And, you know, there have actually been cases of whistleblowers that have had a lot of problems as a result of whistleblowing. You know, in the book, remember the Kristen Gilbert case? Well, Kristen Gilbert, uh, we found out about it from a couple of really brave nurses who went to management and management poo-pooed them. The whole story, this is true throughout the world. And then they came to us. And you know what? These nurses, they're human beings. And when you're human beings, you have your own problems. So what would happen was the nurse could go to management and the management would say, well, did you actually see uh, Kristen Gilbert kill anybody? Well, I didn't see Kristen Gilbert kill anybody, but, and this is true throughout the world, every time this nurse is on duty, the death rate goes up. This nurse takes a vacation, the death rate goes down. Well, that doesn't mean this nurse is a serial killer, does it? No, but you know something interesting? These patients weren't expected to expire when they did. Sometimes they were actually improving only to all of a sudden code and have a, a heart attack. And Kristen Gilbert would come in and try to rescue them, but they expired. But the strange thing is they were actually improving. And management says this, well, so you didn't actually see um, this nurse kill anybody, did you know? Well, let me ask you some questions uh, about yourself, nurse. Um, is all your education up to snuff? Is your license and everything current? I mean, if we drug tested you right now, are we going to find some substances that we shouldn't find? You know why I'm asking this, nurse? It's actually for your own 
protection. It's for your own protection. Because you see, once you start making these allegations, well, you sort of kind of become under investigation yourself, okay? So we just want to protect you and we want to make sure that you're okay. Well, these nurse whistleblowers in the Kristen Gilbert case, yeah, they had issues like this. But in spite of that, they came forth and they had to admit it in court. They had to come right out and admit it in court about the problems that they were having. And that took a tremendous amount of courage. So after Kristen Gilbert gets convicted of murdering a number of our nation's heroes at the Northampton VA Medical Center, when these whistleblowers return to work, do you think they're greeted as heroes? Oh, of course not. It's the opposite. You know what their co-workers will say? What the hell did you do to us in this hospital? You know, this hospital used to have the finest reputation. Now, because of you and bringing in the investigators, when people drive by this hospital, you know what they say? That's where that nurse serial killer worked. I'm not going in there. You know, you can actually close this hospital down. We could lose all of our jobs. Uh, thanks a lot, whistleblower. You know, did you really have to do all this? That's the thanks that they get for saving lives. Because otherwise, she would have continued working there and killing people. But that's the thanks, the appreciation they got from their own co-workers. You know, there's a very interesting story. This is outside of the VA in the private sector about two nurses in a place called Kermit, Texas. Kermit, Texas is in the oil basin. It's a very remote area. It's very tough to find doctors and nurses to work in this place. Well, these two nurses, they were actually the entire compliance department of the hospital. And they realized that this doctor is harming patients. So they go to the management and management says, do you know how hard it is to find doctors and nurses in Kermit, Texas? Why, we have to go all the way to the Philippines or Ireland. So you know what? Be happy we even have doctors here and keep your mouth shut and just go back to your little office. And these nurses say, well, what the hell do we do now? Well, nurses, I have an idea. Let's send an anonymous letter, an anonymous letter to state medical board about this doctor. Well, eventually the doctor gets wind of it and boy, is he pissed. So he calls the local sheriff, a guy named... Sheriff Roberts, who happens to be one of his patients, and he says, Sheriff Roberts, I think these women are intentionally trying to harm my reputation. Do something about it. And the sheriff says, don't worry, doc, I'm on the case. And he gets a search warrant for their hospital computers, finds out that they were the authors of the anonymous letter, and actually has them fired and then arrested and prosecuted for misuse of official information which is a felony in those parts, okay? So these ladies have to defend themselves. They have to get their own attorneys. They're fired. They go to trial. The jury is out for about 20 minutes. The jury comes back and says, what, are you kidding me? These nurses deserve a medal for what they did, not to be criminally prosecuted. And they, got, they won and they got money back. But what kind of message? What kind of message does that send out to other whistleblowers? They say, hey, did you hear about those two nurses in Texas? Did you hear what they had to go through? You know what? I don't think I want to be the one to blow the whistle. I don't think I want to say anything here. There's no incentive for me to blow the whistle here. You know, just the opposite. There's certainly no financial incentive for me to blow the whistle here. So it takes a lot of courage throughout the world, throughout the world. And there are many, many, many instances of nurses and doctors who worked, let's say, in hospital A, who suspected something, who never said anything to hospital B, that never said anything to hospital C. Probably one of the most grievous cases is the case of Charles Cullen from Jersey. You remember Charles Cullen? Yep. Charles Cullen started out in Pennsylvania and he wound up in New Jersey. And when Hospital One did in its internal investigation, and some of these hospitals did a pretty good internal investigation, but none of them ever called the police. So when Hospital One suspected something, they never said anything to Hospital Two. 
They never sent anything to hospital three. They never sent anything to hospital four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Finally, in hospital 10, after leaving a trail of about 60 people dead, well, the authorities called and get involved. And when the authorities went back to the previous hospitals where Charles Cullen worked, do you think the hospitals were cooperative with the authorities? Just the opposite. They didn't want to give them copies of their reports of investigations. They didn't want to cooperate. They didn't want to do anything. And this is why medical serial killers throughout the world get away with murdering so many people until they get caught. Until things change, we'll be having this conversation year after year after year. Oh, absolutely. And just with the cases that I've covered most recently with Lucy Leppi, you could see the pattern from pretty much the very beginning forming and taking place. And these whistleblowers like Dr. J.R. Um, trying to get the medical board to listen saying there's something not right when she's there, when these babies are thriving and they're doing better, all of a sudden they crash. And it's, it's sad that these whistleblowers who are so brave take the fall because the hospitals are trying to protect their reputation because that's what's important to them, not their patients that are dying, that they have taken an oath to heal and look out for the best interest of. Look, the overwhelming majority of healthcare providers are the most honest, hardworking, dedicated, compassionate people on the face of the earth. But if you're so inclined to want to commit a series of murders, that's the group you want to work with. Look, if you're a murderer and you're a member of an outlaw motorcycle gang or organized crime, that's where we think murderers are. But you you can't hide in the mafia or you can't hide in an outlaw motorcycle gang. But in a hospital where everyone has taken an oath to save lives. And there are numerous, numerous examples of how many times maybe even you and your co-worker has saved lives. Who's going to believe that someone on that ward is intentionally taking lives? It's just like impossible to believe. You know, it's like the firemen who can't believe that a fireman would actually start a fire. You know, I mean, it's the best place to hide if you're so inclined to commit a series of murders. Look, if you think about it, if you're so inclined to commit a series of murder, what profession and what location might you want? Well, first of all, you'd want a profession that has the power of life and death over someone. And what professions do we know have the power of life and death over someone, okay? I mean, you want to work with a group of people that have taken an oath to save lives. You know, I mean, and that is the absolute fact. 99.999999% of them, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to save lives, okay? You want to get a profession where the victim and the family trust you implicitly. Listen to that nurse, sweetheart. Listen to that doctor. They have your best interest in mind. And of course, again, almost always have your best interest in mind. That's absolutely true. I mean, you want to work in a place where the strong and assertive all of a sudden become the meek and mild. You know, you could be a big, tough construction worker on the outside, but when you're in the hospital, you see that big, tough guy shaking when that little nurse is coming over with a big needle, you know, and they don't ask any questions. They don't question anything. They're not feeling well. They just want to get better. And they just allow the staff to do whatever they're doing because they're not themselves. They're not the tough guy or the tough gal they are on the outside. They all of a sudden become pretty meek and mild on the inside. And you want to work in a place where there's a shortage of staff. Look, nursing is a very tough profession. It has a very high burnout rate. I mean, uh, in some parts of the world, it's so hard to find doctors and nurses So, you know, excuse me, if we didn't do the best background investigation possible, but luckily we even found somebody to work here. 
Okay, so, you know, you have to cut us a little slack, all right? Look, you want to work in a place where death is a common everyday occurrence. You know, if somebody dies in a hospital or a nursing home, is that news? You know, is the news trucks going to show up there? Are police going to show up? No, death is a common everyday occurrence, right? You want to work somewhere where you're kind of alone, like 3 a.m. on a ward, and it's just the nurse and maybe a nurse's aide, and you could take that curtain and put that curtain around you and the patient, and nobody's going to really see what's going on, and no cameras are going to see what's going on there. So, you know, it's a pretty, pretty good place to work, you know? And then if you think about it, and we talked about this is a place where cops don't want to come in to do investigations. It's an environment they're totally unfamiliar with. So you can see how all these ducks kind of start to line up as a really perfect place to commit a murder. So then what do you do, like smuggling a knife or a gun? Well, there's no need to do that because the hospital provides all the death-dealing chemicals you would ever need, some of which are untraceable even with today's modern toxicology. So you got the perfect job, you got the perfect location, and then management is going to defend you at the killer because they're so concerned about their own reputation and the reputation of the hospital. So my God, what a wonderful place to work if you are so inclined to kill people. And that's why they get away with it for so long all over the world. Absolutely. It is truly for a killer. It is the perfect environment. You have vulnerable victims literally handed to you on a daily basis. You have a arsenal of murder weapons at your disposal you have it's it's truly a perfect environment for a wolf in sheep's clothes clothing but how exactly did you get into this line of work how did you get started into working for the federal government being an investigator you know what how did that path happen for you okay well i was always a fan of shows like columbo you know, and uh, I'm not a big, strong, tough guy, so I could never be like a dirty Harry kind of guy. But then when I watched Columbo, I said, gee, that looks like something I'd like to do. So, you know, when I was in college, someone from the federal government came around and they spoke to us and they said, hey, listen, you got to get in the federal government. It's a great place to work. Take any job you can. So I started out being a technician for an Army Reserve unit. I was in the Army Reserve. And six months later, there was an opening to be an investigator for the Defense Department. So now I'm starting to work my way in the world of investigations. And I started out by doing background investigations for applicants who required a top secret security clearance. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I started doing fraud cases involving the Department of Defense. And then Jimmy Carter created these offices of inspector generals throughout the federal government. All right. And most offices of inspector generals are set up this way. There's an office of audit, which has your CPAs and your auditors, and an office of investigations, which are the criminal investigators. We go through the same school as the treasury agents do, carry guns, make arrests, the whole law enforcement thing. But the VA, we were a little unique. We had a third arm, and that was the Office of Healthcare Inspections. And the Office of Healthcare Inspections, their responsibility is to go around to all the VA hospitals and nursing homes and make sure that everything is safe and secure for our veterans and the hospital is following its policies and procedures. And sometimes all three groups work together. And sometimes they work separately. So I started out then at, at the VA and doing a hospital investigations. This was the time I started in the hospital was 1980. And basically stayed in hospital investigations for the entire rest of my career in the government and in the private sector. And, you know, hospitals, you have to remember, they're like small cities. I mean, just think of the tremendous procurement and construction, right? You're always going by a hospital, they're building a new wing, they're building something, all right? So there is a tremendous amount 
of money that flows in and out of hospitals, both government money and private money. They also have a lot of narcotics in hospitals, right? They have some of the most complex medical and scientific equipment. And they also purchase little items like diapers. So it's everything from diapers to the most complex scientific equipment are being purchased there. And like any major city, you have theft problems. You have security problems concerning the medical records. You have, there are, I mean, there are so many problems in the hospital. There's theft drug diversion, you know, nurses and doctors who steal drugs sometimes for their own personal use on rare occasion for resales. You have hospitals' electronic records that are constantly under attack by hackers. So there's so much outside of medical serial killers that a hospital has to worry about. And that was the smorgasbord of cases I was dealing with until... One day I get a call from the chief of uh, psychiatry at the Northport VA Medical Center. And she says, Bruce, you're not going to believe this, but there's a doctor working here who spent time in prison for poisoning his co-workers. What? (laughs) How can anybody pass a government background investigation and become a doctor treating our nation's heroes who spent time in prison for poisoning his co-workers? Uh, Seems impossible. But I was wrong. This is exactly what the situation was. And that's how I met this chap by the name of Dr. Michael Swango, MD. And Michael Swango killed people all over the world, not just at, at the VA. And just to give you a little background on Michael Swango, when he was in medical school, his fellow students referred to him as Double O Swango, licensed to kill. Because it seemed like patients were expiring unexpectedly after they got a visit from this medical student, but they couldn't prove anything. But they showed that he was very sloppy with his uh, documentation. And so they go to the dean and they say, you know, dean, we don't think this guy Swango should be a doctor. And the dean says, what do you know? You're only students. I'm the dean. He should be a doctor. He just needs a little more training, a little bit more education. So we'll keep him an extra six months and then he'll graduate. And that's what happens. He goes to Ohio State University. In Ohio State University, patients start expiring unexpectedly, including this one patient. Her name was Cynthia McGee. Cynthia McGee was a student at the university. She got in a car accident with another student. She's actually improving until she gets a visit from Dr. Swango. And then she dies unexpectedly. But Michael Swango was never charged with that. You see, the student who hit her with his car, he was charged with vehicular homicide, but he didn't actually kill Cynthia McGee. Uh, Swango killed Cynthia McGee. Well, the hospital does its internal investigation, and they can't prove that Swango killed anybody. So Swango is, leaves the hospital and becomes an EMT. He goes back home and becomes an EMT. And he loves this EMT. He loves the excitement, pulling up to an accident, and there are bodies and blood, and he loves all this stuff. And he's doing pretty well. And one day he invites his coworkers in to their little lounge area, and he brings in donuts, and he gives them donuts. That night they go home, and they're all very, very sick from eating the donut. And Swango would call each one of them up and say, tell me all your symptoms. Tell me everything that happened to you. Give me all the details. You see, this is his second bite of excitement, pardon the pun. The first one is the donuts sprinkling arsenic on them. The second one is hearing how the people suffered. Well, these EMTs are not stupid. A couple of weeks later, Swango comes in with some iced tea. But this time, they don't want to drink the iced tea. They have the iced tea tested, and it's loaded with arsenic. And Swango gets arrested and prosecuted and spends three years in jail for poisoning his co-workers. Now, I didn't think in the United States of America, you could spend three years in jail for poisoning people and come out and be a physician, but I was wrong. Of course, you see, Michael Swango, being a sociopath, could be incredibly charming. He was a handsome guy, could be incredibly charming. And he lied and he fabricated documents. And he said that he was in a 
prison because of a barroom brawl. He's a tough ex-Marine. But here's a piece of paper. The governor restored his civil rights. And in the hospitals that were short for staff said, oh, great, come on in. And he winds up working on the West Coast. And on the West Coast, he's doing well until the story comes out that he spent time in prison for poisoning his co-workers. When he was on the West Coast, he gets engaged to this uh, wonderful VA nurse, Kristen Kenny, her name was. And once the story comes out, they separate and Kristen goes home to her mom and dad. And she says, you know, I really love this guy, Swango. But when I was living with him, I was getting these headaches. I was getting these headaches. But, you know, I feel I feel better now. And then a couple of weeks later, ding dong, the doorbell rings. And it's Mr. Charming himself, Swango. And he charms his way back into her life. And things don't work out that well. And um, she's very upset. And she takes a gun. She goes to the park. And she blows her brains out. Well, you can't blame Swango for that, can you? Well, actually, you can, because the family, although the body was cremated, kept a lock of her hair, and we had the hair tested, and it was loaded with arson. So to make a long story short, Swango travels about, and then he winds up at the v- in my neighborhood at the VA hospital in Northport, Long Island. And he was there for a residency in psychiatry, which meant... He had to go in front of a board of trained psychiatrists and convince each one of them that he should be in the program, which he did. And he winds up at the VA, and that's when I get that phone call. So I go visit this guy as soon as I get the phone call. And he looked like he came right off the golf course, well tanned, and handsome, charming guy. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd want to introduce him to my daughter. Hey, he's a handsome ex-Marine doctor. If she brought him home, I'd say, welcome to the family. When's the wedding? He gives me the same story, you know, the bar and brawl story and all that. And then when we get a little bit more serious and I ask him for permission to search his room, that's when he's not so charming anymore. And that's when he tells us we have to leave. And then the next thing you know, he leaves He's on a plane to Zimbabwe, Africa. And in Zimbabwe, Africa, he kills women and children and pregnant women. So what do we do now? Well, Swango had to return to the United States to renew his passport. And that's when we arrested him, but not for murder, because we didn't have any evidence that he murdered anybody. We arrested him for every federal agent's favorite crime, lying to the government. If you lie on a piece of paper, if you lie when you talk to a government agent, that's a felony. And he got three years in jail for lying about his background. And then the assistant U.S. attorney says, all right, Bruce, you've got this window of time now while he's in prison to try to find out if he murdered anybody at the Northport VA Medical Center. Now, I had never done a murder case before because my smorgasbord of cases were everything but every other conceivable hospital crime imaginable, except a professional who's murdering patients. I never had anything like that. So that's when my boss introduces me to Dr. Michael Bodden. And Dr. Michael Bodden, the famous forensic pathologist, had a show on TV called Autopsy. He's always on the news at these high profile cases. And he said, don't worry, Bruce, I'll teach you how to do this. And this is what we're going to do. And this has now become the standard procedure probably throughout the world. Uh, First thing we're going to do, we're going to assemble a team. And this team is going to consist of himself as a forensic pathologist, of course, my investigators as the investigators, but we're going to need a physician who's expert in chart review, who can review patients' charts and make a determination that that There's no medical reason why that patient should have expired when they did. And we had to gather up all the medical records of all the patients at the Northport VA at that time, because Swango used to like to walk around and travel throughout the hospital and visit patients. Then we need a toxicologist, somebody to do the tox work, you know, the blood work and the tox work. And then... We're going to recruit, at that time, it was a relatively new profession called forensic nursing. Nurses who were trained in both forensic science and the science nursing, and they were phenomenal. They were fantastic. 
And this team kind of narrowed it down to six really good cases where all these professionals, in their opinion, could not really come to a valid medical reason as to why these patients expired when they did. So the next step is to exhume the bodies because these patients are all dead and buried, which means that my agents had to go to the families of the deceased and ring their doorbells and say something like this, you know, hi, my name is Bruce Sackman. I'm with the Inspector General's Office of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. We have reason to believe that your dad's death may have been of a suspicious nature. Can we have permission to go to the cemetery and dig up his body and run some tests? Imagine getting a visit like that. That's, uh, that's quite a shock to get a visit like this. But of course, the families were fantastic. Sometimes they actually wanted to be at the exhumation and watch it happen. Other times they didn't want. And then I find myself at the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office, and I've never done anything like this before, where there's a whole host of bodies half open <laughs> with their body parts and difference. That was a cultural experience, <laughs> as you can imagine. And then Dr. Bonin, he's showing me the heart of one of these veterans. And he says, you see, the, the death certificate says this veteran died of heart disease, uh, myocardial infarction. He says, there's nothing wrong with this heart here. He says, this is bogus. There's something else that killed these people. Some kind of external drug that probably killed these people. So what is it? And that's when we had to turn to the toxicology. You know, first, we asked the FBI lab to do this. They declined to do it. So we had to go to a private lab, a lab called National Medical Services in Pennsylvania. They're the largest private forensic lab in the United States. And the question is, can you find certain poisons or drugs in embalmed tissue? Because remember, these people were buried and embalmed. And the answer was yes. You know, we have this new machine, Bruce. It's called the High Performance Liquid Chromatography Tandem Mass Spectrometer. Holy cow. How does it work? Oh, you couldn't understand, Bruce. You wouldn't understand. Trust us, it works. You know, they get a little tissue sample, and it's like Willy Wonka to me. It goes around, 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 around. Boom, comes out. All right, so it came out. There were traces of succinylcholine, which is a paralytic, which they use in the hospital. They want to put a tube down you. There was no medical reason in the chart why, why some of these patients should have had succinylcholine. And there were traces of uh, epinephrine, which is adrenaline, which is used to speed up the heart. So now Swango's getting out of jail. And he thinks he's just going to hop on a plane and continue his worldwide murder crusade. Not so fast. Well, first of all, we got very, very lucky because the United States had entered into an extradition treaty with the government of Zimbabwe. The government of Zimbabwe had an arrest warrant for Michael Swango for killing women and children and pregnant women. Boy, were they anxious to get their hands on him. So when he gets out of jail, we say, look, we've just indicted you for the murder of a number of our veterans at the Northport VA Medical Center. If we go to trial, and even if you're acquitted, we're just going to put you on the plane and drop you off on the tarmac in Zimbabwe. Good luck, buddy. Well, he decided to plead guilty. And he pled guilty. And this is where the whole emotional part of this, because, you know, we talk about the science and the investigations of all these cases and the number of murders, but we forget there's a whole human side to this. There's a family's how emotional this is for the families. And you realize this as an investigator, not only when you speak to the families as witnesses, but at the sentencing, when the families have an opportunity to get up and speak about their dad, how their dad survived the war, whether it was Korea or Vietnam, you know, only to be murdered at a VA hospital. It's very, very moving. And of course, Swango sat there, almost reminded me of like a Nazi war criminal, just sat there at attention and didn't flinch. And then the judge asked him to explain in his own words exactly what he did. And he said, he stood up at attention and he said he murdered these people using a paralytic. He didn't say exactly what drug, but he just said using a paralytic like succinacol. 
He didn't say that, but it's like so. And then it was time for sentencing. And Judge Mishler, out in the Eastern District, sentenced him to three consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. And then he said something I had never heard before. The judge says, you know, right now there's no parole in the federal system. But if Congress should change the law and grant parole, your parole is denied in advance. So there's no way this guy is getting out. He's in supermax federal penitentiary. And then about a month ago, I get a phone call from this woman and she says, Bruce, I think you missed one. What are you talking about? She, he says, my dad was at Northport when Swango was there and she goes through the whole scenario. I don't remember this case to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't remember this. She may be right. I just, I don't remember the case, but there's really nothing we could do at this point. I mean, the guy got three consecutive life terms. A fourth is not going to make a difference. Yeah. You know, I said, well, what exactly do you want? And she says, I want the VA to acknowledge that my dad was murdered at the hospital. Not for me to say, you know, I'm not at the VA. I doubt if they're going to do that. But I understood. And you know what? It's probably not the only one I missed. I probably missed others. And this is true also throughout the world. We have no choice but to concentrate on the very, very best cases. Because if we brought them all in and they start knocking some out, then the jury is going to start questioning everything. So we have to always narrow down. It's a matter of resources, too. The very, very best cases we could get. And so after that case, all of a sudden, I'm the expert. I make one case, one case, but no one else has ever made a case like this in the VA. So all of a sudden, I'm the VA's expert. And the next thing you know, Kristen Gilbert surfaces. You know, Nurse Kristen Gilbert. And those people who Google her to see, you know, look, my vision of a serial killer was always like a Charles Manson type, you know, a crazy with a swastika on his fighter. Here comes a typical soccer mom. Mm-hmm. In fact, when you look at her and you look at Lucy Letby, they could almost be sisters, these two. All right. As a matter of fact, they had a, more in common than the way they look. Because if you remember with Lucy Letby, you know, the nurse who murdered a number of babies in England, for those who aren't familiar, just recently, the trial just recently ended. One of her uh, scenarios or motivations, and we could talk about that, was that a physician who she probably really had the odds for uh, would show up every time there was a code and the two of them would be interacting during the code. Well, this is exactly what happened with Kristen Gilbert. In Kristen Gilbert, every time a code was called, her boyfriend who happened to be a VA police officer, would respond to the code as well. And witnesses would say the two were like kind of grabbing each other, you know, during the code. It was almost like a sexual experience for them. So Lucy Letby and Kristen Gilbert, a lot more in common than the fact that they look like each other. They all caused the code and when this code happened, by a code, I mean a cardiac arrest and the crash card and the nurses come running in, it's very, very excitement. That was the same scenario for both Kristen Gilbert and for Lucy Ledby. So Kristen Gilbert, what's the cause of death? What, what did she use? Well, we went to the lab and, you know, they had that machine, that high performance, you know, the, the, with the name about that long. <laughs> Epinephrine, they said. Okay, great. Witnesses say they actually saw her with an EpiPen, an epinephrine pen all the time. And the deaths were certainly consistent with epinephrine poisoning. And then I get a phone call from the lab and they say, "Uh, sorry, Bruce, we made a mistake. We can't really say it's epinephrine, but have a nice trial. So then we had to let the defense know, of course, that we didn't have the toxicology, but we went forth anyway. The trial lasted for six months because we had our scientists lined up to say that the death was consistent with epinephrine poisoning. Even though we didn't have the toxicology, the jury agreed 
And she got sentenced to multiple life terms also without the possibility of parole. But this is interesting because this case occurred in Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts. It was a death penalty case in a state that doesn't have the death penalty. Well, how that happened? Because the crime actually occurred at a federal hospital. So the federal law kicked in, not the state law. And the federal law has a death penalty. In fact, if she was given the death penalty, she would have been the first woman executed outside from um, Ethel Rosenberg, the atomic bomb spy. She was the last woman executed in the federal system. So there's a separate trial now. The same jury that just convicted her of these murders, now there's a separate trial to determine whether Kristen Gilbert should get the death penalty or not. And talk about moving. That is really moving because that's when pictures of the deceased are shown, their history in the military. The family gets up and speaks about how wonderful dad was. I mean, it was very, very moving. But the jury came back and they said, life without parole, not the death penalty. And we were actually happy with that because Kristen was a mom. She had two kids. You know, I mean, you wouldn't know that reading the newspapers because the newspapers thought we were like the Gestapo ready to hang her in the town square. And believe me, nothing could be further from the truth. We were really kind of happy that she got life, you know, but did we get every victim? Nope. We actually suspected maybe she killed as many as 30 people, but we couldn't prove that number. And that's that's true with all these cases that I've done or I've assisted with throughout the world. You know, um, in Germany, there's a fellow by the name of Niles Hogel. Niles Hogel, when he worked in Hospital A and they suspected something, this is Germany. Do you think they said anything to Hospital B? Do you think they said anything to Hospital C? The German police, to their credit, had to exhume bodies in three different countries. Oh. Niles Hogel himself eventually admitted to killing over a hundred people. The German police think it's closer to 300. These medical serial killers kill so many people, they can't remember themselves how many people they killed. All right. There's a famous medical serial killer named um, Donald Harvey, killed people in the VA and outside of the VA. And Donald Harvey, his own words were this. He says, after I killed the first 15 and no one even questioned me, well, I thought I was ordained by the Almighty himself to do this. Not so crazy if you kill 15 people and your co-workers don't even raise an eyebrow. So this is the crazy world of medical serial killers, all right? And this is why they get away with killing so many people. Until we change the education, we change the laws for whistleblowers, and we start to prosecute, in my opinion, one or two of these managers who actually aided and abetted these murders, this thing is going to continue. I mean, I'm sure you probably read about the terrible COVID deaths at the uh, veterans' nursing homes in New Jersey, right? Over 100 veterans died. Uh, the state had to pay out millions of dollars to the families. But did anyone get prosecuted for it? No. So you see, if you're a manager and all you do is defend the reputation of the hospital, even at the cost of the lives of people, what's the worst that's going to happen to you? Eh, maybe you'd lose your job. Maybe. Probably just get transferred and find a job in another hospital. Is it going to cost you personally any money out of your savings? No, because either the state or the hospital is going to pay all the fines and penalties. And are you going to go to jail? Never. There's never, in my view, I've never seen a successful prosecution of any manager anywhere who aided and abetted these murders. And until that happens, managers are going to say, my job is to defend the reputation of the hospital, even at the cost of lives. And if things go bad, well, the hospital is going to have to pay the fines. It's not going to be me. Where's the incentive? The 
whistleblowers, did they get any money out of this? No, all they got is a lot of heartache, right? And aggravation from it. You know, if you report a fraud against the government, you can actually make money. There's a thing called a key tam suit. Have you ever heard of this? I have not, no. A key tam is spelled Q-U-I-T-A-M. It's actually based on the Latin, he who sings, uh, he who sues, excuse me, he who sues on behalf of the king and himself. The way it works, it goes back to English common law. Let's say you're an employee of the hospital and you know the hospital is defrauding the Medicare program or Medicaid program. You go to an attorney, you lay out the evidence to the attorney. The attorney files a suit in federal court called the key tam suit. It's a whistleblower suit. And you as the relator of that lawsuit can get a reward of up to 25% of all the money recovered. I had a case at the VA where a whistleblower uh, filed a suit against a pharmaceutical company. The pharmaceutical company had to pay millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in fines to the government. The relator got $25 million as a reward for this. Okay. That's called the key TAM suit. But if you, as a whistleblower, report Dr. Swango or Kristen Gilbert, or Lucy Letby, are you going to get a dollar out of that? No. Are you going to get an attorney that's going to want to work with you? No, because there's no financial incentive for reporting murders. There's only financial incentive for reporting fraud. So until we change that, there are a lot of things that have to be changed here. When we change that system and make it possible for people to get a financial reward when it's proven, and of course it has to be proven, that someone's intentionally harming patients and the hospital is fine, well, that relator should get part of that fine as well. It shouldn't just be for fraud. It should also be for when a patient when patients get injured. And the staff needs training. You know, in my book, I have the red flags. Staff need to be trained on these red flags. And finally, Three-prong approach here, education, whistleblower protection and changing the law, and in my view, criminally prosecuting managers who aided and abetted these murders. Until that happens, I'll be your guest next year, and we'll be having the same conversation again, only with new names. You know, as we speak right now, there are a number of cases ongoing, a number of cases ongoing. There's a case in Canada involving a, a physician who allegedly murdered a number of people. There's a case in Germany. There's a case in Texas that's ongoing and one in North Carolina. So these cases are still ongoing. But what has changed? You know, I went on British TV and they, they asked me about the Lucy Let, Let Be case. And they had all their experts and they said one all the important things. And then I said to them, OK, experts, what's different? What's going to be different tomorrow in England that's going to prevent this from happening? You know, what training is different? What whistleblower blower protections are going to be different? All right. What managers are going to be prosecuted to put the fear of God into other managers? Silence. Silence. Nothing has changed. Until it changes, I guess I'll be their guest next year again. <laughs> <laughs> when they have another serial killer. Absolutely. And I, I agree. That is one thousand percent half the battle is the reform that's needed in approaching these cases and handling whistleblowers and dealing with the management that has allowed this to happen for so long. Like, yeah, sure, they're investigating Chester Hospital for not doing anything about Lucy Lepi for so long. Is anything going to happen with that? No, absolutely not. Everyone knows it because nothing ever happens nothing ever happens to hold the management accountable no one nothing ever happens to hold the board of directors accountable for the hospital i mean dr jrm you know has been given so much shit for trying to blow the whistle on lucy Lepi, and he should be regaled as a hero wasn't he told by management to apologize to her? He was. He was told yeah, to apologize. apologize. He was told he to let it go. He was told 
to essentially just leave her alone. Why are you bothering with this? Leave her alone. She's a good nurse. You know, she, she helps these babies. She's not helping these babies because the only time these babies were safe was when she was in wherever she was, Spain, I think on vacation. That's the only time these babies were safe. And then the day she came back to work, two triplets died and another one almost died. And yet, like I say, we're going to be having this conversation again and again until things change. You know, there was, I mean, look, we'll be watching these cases, this case in Canada. It's a doctor named Adla. He's accused of killing, uh, intentionally murdering some COVID-19 patients. And there's a similar case in Germany where a doctor is accused of murdering some COVID-19 patients. You know, the interesting thing about COVID-19 what was the first thing we heard when COVID-19 came up? Well, families are not allowed in the hospital. It's not safe. So getting back to our original discussion, if you're looking for a place to murder people, the hospital was the best place before COVID. What about after COVID when the families can't even come in to visit the patient? That makes your job just that much easier, doesn't it? All right. So there are a number of cases now, you know, connected with COVID. God forbid we never see that again, but could happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think just seeing all the cases that are cropping up out of the woodwork, it's like you it makes you realize that not only was the pandemic just crippling for everybody and affected everybody so devastatingly. But it also allowed medical serial killers to essentially run rampant. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? They had they had the best place to work to begin with. That made it even better. And not only that, but many hospitals couldn't find staff. You know, in fairness to them, in New York, they had to bring in patients, you know, they had to bring in physicians and nurses from all over the world to help out. I understand that. And you know what? If let's say, for instance, you're in the infantry and the enemy's coming over the line, well, you don't have time to do a thorough background investigation on every infantryman who's going to be standing next to you. You're just happy you have a body there next to you, right? Absolutely. Well, it was the same thing. I mean, the hospitals had to rely on all these outside services to do quickie background investigations. And look, they had a number of traveling doctors and nurses, the majority of them were fine. But there were a number of them who had their own evil intent, not necessarily to murder patients, but a number of them were involved in diverting drugs, stealing drugs from the hospital for their own personal use. And they had a long history of it. But that history was never disclosed because we were in panic mode. We had to get the bodies there. That's what happens when you hide. As my, my, my boss used, my old boss used to have a great saying, he used to say, Hire in haste, repent in leisure. And that's exactly what happened in the hospitals, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, it it's sad to think that these medical professionals have to take a hit because of the nefarious doings of those that are supposed to be caring for patients. And because... At the end of the day, as you said, they are some of the most giving and heartfelt people and, you know, dedicating their lives to caring for those that need to be cared for. And it is a tough job. And it's sad that they are infiltrated by these evil, evil people when this should be at at the very least, hospitals and doctors' offices should be a safe place and a peaceful place for those that are incredibly ill, that may be dying, that may have any plethora of medical issues. And then you have a medical serial killer come along and turn everything upside down. That's exactly right. You know, to me, a hospital was always, well, a sanctuary from crime. You know, you went to a hospital after you became a victim of crime, not the first be a victim of crime. Absolutely. It has been such an honor speaking with you today. It has been such an honor 
kind of picking your brain about medical serial killers and hearing about Swango in your own words, because I, I read them and it's it's so different to hear it from you who actually lived it and dealt with it and investigated it. And it has been wonderful having you on. And I really hope that my listeners out there have enjoyed this experience as much as I have. Thank you very much for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Well, thank you very much. And guys, as I said in the beginning, I will have the link to Behind the Murder Curtain in the source notes below. It is such a good read. You know, I love, you know, I love a good book. And this was phenomenal. It was so interesting to really see, get a look behind the scenes of an investigation. And Lisa will be on the next one. You know, she's sorry she missed this, but we will see you all in the next one. Bye guys. Thank you so much for listening to this chapter of the Book of the Dead. And don't forget that you can always connect with us on Instagram. You can connect with us on Twitter and you can absolutely connect with us on Patreon. We also have a merch store as well that we have frequent discount codes coming out for so that you guys can get merch hand-drawn by myself at a better cost. We hope you have a lovely rest of your week. And just remember, please be kind. And don't forget to always stay safe, stay curious, and stay vigilant. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.